Good afternoon and welcome to guests both old and new. We are returning again today uh, to Enoch Powell's Freedom and Reality and uh, we're picking up where we left off last time in the in chapter uh, chapter 13 on immigration and uh, last time I was joined by some uh, one, wonderful guests and we we didn't get very far which is which which is good but uh, this time looks like I'm, I'm on my own so so I may be able to make some good progress in terms of page count today um, if anyone would, lo would like to join and contribute they are welcome to do so the link is in the discord and uh, if anyone wants to come and jump on and keep me company, that's absolutely fine. But I, uh, I appreciate it's a very sunny, warm day, and I'm I'm probably alone in uh, there's probably not many like me stuck indoors. So um, let's uh, let's carry on where we left off. The other dangerous delusion from which those who are willfully or otherwise blind to realities suffer. <laughs> let's let's get my teeth in. Let's start again. The other dangerous delusion from which those who are wilf willfully or otherwise blind to reality suffer is summed up in the word integration. To be integrated into a population means to become, for all practical purposes, indistinguishable from its other members. Now, at all times where there are marked physical differences, especially of colour, integration is difficult, though over a period not impossible. There are, among the Commonwealth immigrants who have come to live here in the last 15 or so years, many thousands whose wish and purpose is to be integrated and whose every thought and endeavour is bent in that direction. But to imagine that such a thing enters the heads of a great and growing majority of immigrants and their descendants is a ludicrous misconception and a dangerous one to boot. Communalism we are on the verge of a change. Hitherto, it has been force of circumstance and of background which has rendered the very idea of integration inaccessible to the greater part of the immigration po immigrant population. That they never conceived or intended such a thing, and that their numbers and physical concentration meant that the presses towards integration, which normally bear upon any small minority, did not operate. <laughs> Now we are seeing the growth of positive forces acting against integration of vested interests in the preservation and sharpening of racial and religious differences with a view to the exercise of actual domination, first over fellow immigrants and then over the rest of the population. The cloud no bigger than a man's head that can so rapidly overcast the sky has been visible recently in Wolverhampton and has shown signs of spreading quickly. The words I am about to use verbatim as they appeared in the local press of the 17th of February 1968 are not mine, but those of a Labour member of Parliament whose minister, who is a minister in the government. The Sikh community campaign to maintain customs inappropriate in Britain uh, is much to be regretted. Working in Britain, particularly in the public services, they should be prepared to accept the terms and conditions of their employment, to claim special communal rights, or should one say rights, R-I-T-E-S, leads to a dangerous fragmentation within society. This communalism is a canker, whether practised by one colour or another, it is to be strongly condemned. And that's a, that's a quote from a then Labour minister. All credit to John Stonehouse for having had the insight to perceive that and the courage to say it. For these dangerous and divisive elements, the legislation proposed in the Race Relations Bill is the very pabulum they need to flourish. Here is the means of showing that the immigrant communities can organise to consolidate their members, to agitate and campaign against their fellow citizens, and to overawe and dominate the rest with the legal weapons which the ignorant and the ill-informed have provided. As I look ahead, I am filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. That tragic and intractable phenomenon, which we watch with horror on the other side of the Atlantic, but which there is interwoven with the history of and existence of the states itself, is coming upon us here by our own volition 
and our own neglect. Indeed, it has all but come. In numerical terms, it will be of American proportions long before the end of the century. Only resolute and urgent action will avert it even now. Whether there will be the public will to demand and obtain that action, I do not know. All I know is that to see and not to speak would be great betrayal. That speech delivered in Birmingham on the 20th of April 1968 provoked a political furore without precedent since the end of the war. The issue had been suppressed or ignored by politicians and journalists for far too long. There is a sense of hopelessness and helplessness which comes over persons who are trapped or imprisoned when all their effort to attract attention and assistance brings no response. This is the kind of feeling which you in Warsaw and we in Wolverhampton are experiencing in the face of the continued flow of immigration into our towns. We are, of course, in a minority. Make no mistake about that. Out of over 600 parliamentary constituencies, perhaps less than 60 are affected in any way like ourselves. The rest know little or nothing, and we might sometimes be tempted to feel care, and we might sometimes be tempted to feel care little or nothing. Only this week, a colleague of mine in the House of Commons was dumbfounded when I told him of a constituent whose little daughter was now the only white child in her class at school. He looked at me as if I were a member of Parliament for Central Africa who had suddenly dropped from the sky into Westminster. So far as most people in the British Isles are concerned, you and I might as well be living in Central Africa for all they know about our circumstances. Some problems are unavoidable. Some evils can be coped with to a certain extent, but not prevented. But that a nation should have saddled itself without necessity and without countervailing benefit with a wholly avoidable problem of immense dimensions is enough to make one weep. That the same nation should be should stubbornly persist in allowing the problem, great as it already is, to be magnified further, is enough to drive one to despair. You here in Warsaw, like us in Wolverhampton, are unable to provide school education for all our children from the statutory age because of the continuing influx of immigrants. Yet the present law makes it impossible to prevent some 40 or 50,000 actual or alleged dependents, mostly children of school age or below, from entering this country every year. And again, I'd like to stress that he is talking gross. He is talking gross. Um, when we talk about immigration today, we talk in net terms and we talk of 300,000. He is talking 40 to 50,000. Gross. I believe at the time he writes this, the net immigration statistic was actually an outflow. It is hard to describe such a policy or lack of policy otherwise than as crazy. The reuniting of families is something to which no one would wish to present obstacles, but there are two directions in which families can be reunited. And here the proposal put forward by the Conservative Party for assistance to voluntarily, to, to voluntary repatriation has, a cer has certainly a role to play. No other country on earth having carefully fixed a quota of persons it thought right to admit on grounds of employment, etc., would then also admit on uh, would then also admit in consequence an indefinite number of actual or alleged dependents without any power of control whatsoever up to the age 16 and on the various discretionary categories beyond that age. There is a mistaken impression about there is a mistaken impression about that the inflow of immigrants unconditionally admitted as dependents will tail off as time goes by. There is no ground for supposing this. On the contrary, if we continue to admit by voucher about 8,000 8, adult male immigrants a year with an unrestricted right of entry for dependents, the present inflow, which represents an additional million taken in every 20 years, or another two millions by the turn of the century will be easily maintained. It follows that either the issue of vouchers must be virtually terminated or the unconditional right of entry for dependents withdrawn or both. 
Recently, those of us who live in the Midlands and in other areas directly affected have been startled to learn that a provision in the Kenya Independence Act and similar British legislation has the unexpected effect that some 200,000 Indians in Kenya alone have become literally indistinguishable from the people of the United Kingdom, so that they have an absolute right of entry to this country and thus enjoy privileges which no Commonwealth citizen, whether from Canada or Australia, Nigeria or Hong Kong, possesses. What is more startling is that the government have remained completely supine through their atten- though their attention has been drawn to this both by politicians, I devoted an entire speech to it in October, and by non-politicians. Then there is the whole question of legality and verification. It is almost incredible that under our law, a person who has made good his entry into this country unlawfully cannot be sent home when the malpractice comes to light. The people of other countries, Commonwealth countries, no less than others, have no hesitation whatever in expelling those who break the law to cross their frontiers. They must think that, to use a famous phrase, we are stark staring bonkers to offer all illegal entrants a prize for breaking the law by promising that if they slip through, they can stay here for keeps. It sounds like a children's playground game, not the policy of a nation which, uh, through its own past sins of omission, is menaced with a problem at the present rate, which at the present rate will, by the end of the century, be similar in magnitude to that in the United States now. It is no kindness on the part of politicians to minimise the size which those problems will assume, even if from now onwards every possible legislative and administrative action is taken to limit it. To draw attention to those problems and face them in the light of day is wiser than to apply the method of the ostrich, which rarely yields satisfactory results, even to ostriches. We have just been seeing in Wolverhampton the cloud no bigger than a man's hand in the shape of communalism. Communalism has been the curse of India and we are to be able and we need to be able to recognise it when it rears its head here. Large numbers of Sikhs who had been serving the Wolverhampton Corporation voluntarily and contentedly have found themselves against their will made the material for communal agitation. They have the same right as anyone else to decide which if any of the rules of their sect they will keep and they had found no difficulty in entering the corporation's employment and complying with the same rules as their fellow employees. For those who took a different and a stricter view, there were plenty of other opportunities of employment. It will be the opposite to the equal treatment of all persons within the realm if employers are placed in the position of adjudicating upon the requirements of their employees' religion. The issue in this instance is not racial or religious discrimination, It is communalism. In the 1964 election, the defeat of Gordon Walker at Smetherwick had uh, given a glimpse into the depth of feeling which existed in the constituencies affected. The member for one of them had been speaking and writing locally on this subject for years. Now a wider public began to hear. It is absolutely absurd to say that immigration either is not or ought not to be an issue at this election, and this is 1966, especially for Wolverhampton and other parts of the black country. If by an issue we mean a problem which is felt to affect the welfare of every section of the community, repeat every section, uh, then immigration is preeminently such and has been so for the last decade or more. It would be quite wrong that the policies on this matter of those presenting themselves for election to Parliament should not be known to their prospective constituents. In my view, there is really no one, there is really not one immigration problem, but two distinct and separate immigration problems. One is concerned with the immigrants who are already here. The other is concerned with control over entry to this country. So far as concerns the immigrants who are already here, and many of them have now had their home in this country for 10 years and more, I am, for my part, resolutely determined that they shall, as far as is humanly possible, have the same rights and the same treatment as anyone else, and I have made it clear 
as a member of parliament that they are welcome to any help or support I can give them as any other of my constituents. It will, it will be not years but generations before the social impact of the massive immigration which took place in the decade to 1962 has been effaced. Integration and assimilation are easy words to say, but the things which they denote will only come about gradually over many years of mutual tolerance as the immigrants slowly filter into all the classes and callings in our society. Most of the immigrants, I'm sure, will make a success. Most of them are making a success already in their new home, but a small minority are not and perhaps never will. We believe in the Conservative Party that help should be available to such of these as voluntarily desire it to return to whence they came. It would be a humane provision which could do nothing but good all round. Of course, I stress the word voluntarily. Except for deportation after criminal offences, there could be no question of any kind of duress. But there is one absolutely essential condition for solving this immigration problem, the problem of immigrants who are here, at all, at any time. That is that we solve and soon solve the other immigration problem, namely the question of control over entry. All our efforts at integration, all our determination that a colour problem and racial discrimination shall remain foreign to this country will be overwhelmed and swept away if the tide of new immigrants continues to flow in, arousing anxiety and apprehension for the future in the minds not only of the native-born citizens, but of the existing immigrant population itself. The Conservative Party asserts that even after the measure of control which we introduced in 1962 and which the Labour Party by a remarkable about turn reluctantly accept accepted, still the rate of inflow is far too high. We say therefore that the rate of admission must be further and greatly reduced. Indeed, for my own part and speaking as one who has represented one of the areas most directly affected, I believe there would be no small benefit in a period of years during which the inflow and outflow roughly balanced. I repeat that this is a policy which is equally in the interest of all the inhabitants of this town, the newcomers no less than the native inhabitants, and many have been the Indians, Pakistanis and West Indians among my constituents who have expressed to me their support for measures of control and their anxiety at the consequences for themselves if the inflow continues unabated. Already it was becoming clear that the problem of the future could not be met by controlling the inflow alone. For over 10 years, from about 1954 to 1966, uh, Commonwealth immigration was the principal and at times the only political issue in my constituency in Wolverhampton. Between those dates, entire areas were transformed by the substitution of a wholly or predominantly coloured population for the previous native inhabitants as completely as other areas were transformed by the bulldozer. My uppermost feeling on looking back upon those years is of astonishment that this event which altered the appearance and life of a town and has shattering effects on the lives of many families and persons could take place with virtually no physical manifestation of, of antipathy. This speaks volumes for the steadiness and tolerance of the natives. Acts of an enemy, bombs from the sky, they could understand, but now for reasons quite inexplicable, they might be driven from their homes and their property, deprived of value by an invasion which the government apparently approved and their fellow citizens elsewhere viewed with complacency. Those were the years when a for sale notice going up in a street struck terror into all its inhabitants. I know, for I live within the proverbial stone's throw of streets which, quote unquote, went black. Why, 
the people used to ask me. Is the government bringing these people into our country in ever-growing numbers? And where is this all to end? I tried to explain that the law of England could not distinguish between one British subject and another, and that therefore the inhabitants of India, Africa, and of the West Indies were all the same in law as in as the independent as the inhabitants of Wolverhampton. It was a fiction, perhaps a romantic fiction, but one which could only be maintained if no practical effect was given to it. Year after year, in government and out of it, I begged colleagues to bring the law into line with reality, but the majority of ministers and members had no personal knowledge of what was happening in a few concentrated areas. Timid Action at last, the rising flood of immigration which came on the post-election boom of 1960 forced the government, but oh how slowly and timidly, to make our law like that of every other country on earth, in recognising the difference between its own people and the rest. To subsequent generations it will seem incredible that this was not done until almost a million Commonwealth immigrants had entered. Even when the act began in 1962, the inhabitants of areas affected still could not believe the menace was over. That reassurance came to be felt only after the limitation had taken effect and after the facts of life and the loss of Smethwick, Smethwick, Smethwick and Leighton had driven the, later, the Labour government to maintain and enforce it. The net intake from Africa, Asia and the Caribbean since 1962 has been as follows net intake from these places, net. 1963, 53,000. 1964, 54,000. 1965, 48,000. 1966, 43,000. And he specifies that this that final number is for the first 10 months of that year. In any one year, this rate of inflow is imperceptible but 50,000 a year would still mean an additional net immigration from these countries of one and three quarter million by the end of the century. There are two other factors which reinforce the significance of these figures. The Registrar's General estimated that the United Kingdom will have nil net immigration by about 1975, but note how the balance is arrived at. Inwards, 30,000 from Ireland. 60,000 from the Commonwealth, 30,000 from foreign countries, outwards, 120,000 UK citizens. The figures are obviously highly conjectural, but they illustrate the effect which the combination of immigration with emigration can have on the composition of the population. The remaining factor, obviously, is natural increase. Like all population projections, many estimates, any estimate of this is bound to also be conjectural. One estimate is that by the end of the century, it will have been sufficient to raise the total coloured population to about three and a half millions, or five percent of the whole. But this is in the future. For the moment, compared with the past decade or so, there is a feeling of stabilisation. The immigrants are shaking down and shaking out rather than visibly increasing, and the subject has disappeared below the surface of public consciousness. In my own constituency, where I estimate that about 10% of the population are immigrants from Asia or the Caribbean, I have the impression that, as no doubt elsewhere, the first phase, the sudden impact of common Im Commonwealth immigration, is over. I am going to prophesy, however, that there will be subsequent phases, when the problem will resume its place in public concern, and in a more intractable form, when it can no longer be dealt with simply by turning the inlet tap down or off. Long before the coloured population reaches 5% of the total, a proportion will have filtered into the general population, mingled with it in occupation, residence, habits and intermarriage. On the other hand, the rest, numerically perhaps much the greater part, will be in larger or smaller colonies in certain areas and cities, more separated 
than now in habits, occupation and way of life. The irregular pattern of population and living which grew up higgledy-piggledy in the early years of immigration will have been tidied up. It is for these colonies and the problems thereby entailed on our descendants that they will curse the improvident years now gone when we could have avoided it all. A number of lines of least resistance converge on the preservation of the immigrant colonies. Uh, for causes both external and internal, they soon become self-perpetuating and a number may have done so already. Encouraged back. How then are the dangers at, last, at least to be minimised? The one undeniable and obvious action is to limit the size and problem by, visually, uh, by, by virtually terminating net immigration. Um, I, think it is, I think it not possible that if this were done, a small but significant net emigration might soon follow, especially given aid, inducements and encouragements to immigrants to rejoin families in their countries of origin or to return, or to return thither when they encounter prolonged unemployment or other economic difficulties. Only if the situation were thus numerically stabilised would it be practic practicable to apply methods of dispersal, though these will never affect more than minorities and those the minorities which are anyhow most easily assimilated to the general population. The best I dare to hope is that by the end of the century we shall be left not with a growing and more menacing phenomenon, but with fixed and almost traditional foreign areas in certain towns and cities which will remain as the lasting monuments of a moment of national aberration. Even this relatively happy outcome, however, implies that vigorous action to limit and, if possible, reduce total numbers is taken from now. I fear that it will not be. The fear proved only too well-founded. It was the impulse not only for subs subsequent speeches, but for returning to the subject yet again after the detonation which followed Birmingham. Seven months ago, I made a speech in Birmingham, which attracted some considerable attention. I discussed it in the present and prospective I discussed in it the present and prospective consequences of the immigration of Commonwealth citizens into this country during the last 15 years, which took place because, until 1962, this country alone in all the nations in the world had no definition of its own people, so that for all purposes an Englishman born in Birmingham and a tribesman from the northwestern frontier were indistinguishable in the law of the United Kingdom. It was a subject on which I have spoken and written and on a number of occasions over the preceding months and years. The immediate occasion was the imminent second reading of the government's race relations bill, which the Conservative shadow cabinet, then including myself, had decided and publicly announced its decision to oppose on the ground that the bill would do more harm than good. My speech was made in support and in defence of that decision from the point of view of a member representing a constituency in one of the areas most affected. And it was so understood both by those to whom it was delivered and by the party officials who, in the normal course, were aware of its contents in advance. In the seven months which have elapsed since I spoke, I have been the target of endless abuse and vilification. No imputation or innuendo has been too vile or scurrilous for supposedly reputable journals to invent or repeat. On the other hand, I have been borne up by an astonishing manifestation from among all classes of people and from all areas of the community expressing relief and gratitude that the speech was made. Through all this I have kept silence, with the exception of a five-minute intervention at the Conservative Party conference last month and the unavoidable necessity of answering questions put to me at public meetings, I have not once returned to the subject until now. Sooner or later, however, I was in duty bound to take up the theme again, and since beyond dispute the question, whatever view be taken of it, 
is of deep national concern, and since divisions of opinion upon it do not follow normal party lines, it seems to me a subject appropriate to the platform of an organisation, this is the Rotary organisation to which he's delivering this speech, which is both non-party and devoted to whatever concerns the public interest. I am concerned with the future. I will waste a little time upon the past. Only one domestic thing I ask your indulgence to say briefly in my own defence. It has been freely alleged that I was somehow guilty of a breach of discipline or disloyalty either to my colleagues generally or to the party spokesman on home affairs in particular in speaking as I did. There is no substance in this charge, no rule or convention forbids front benches to advocate or defend, even before parliamentary debate, the line which the leadership of the party has publicly decided to take. There is none which requires them before doing so, so to consult or even inform their colleagues. Such speeches are continually made and indeed expected. It is, of course, different if they intend to recommend a divergent policy, but this it was not suggested I had done. It was to the tone of my speech that objection was taken, so strongly indeed that I was excluded from the shadow cabinet. Now, tone is a matter of personal taste, and a leader is entitled to be guided by his own taste in the choice of his colleagues. What is matter of fact and not matter of opinion is that neither in making the speech nor in any of the circumstances attendant upon it did I neglect or break any of the rules or conventions which govern honourable behaviour between colleagues. Hello, Promethean Healing in the chat. Gulf in the nation. The reaction to that speech revealed a deep and dangerous gulf in the nation, a gulf which is, I fear, no narrower today than it was then. I do not mean between indigenous population and the immigrants. On the contrary, over the months and years, the pressure upon me to oppose the growth in number of immigrants has come as much from my immigrant constituents as from the rest, if not more so. In this matter, I was convinced of speaking for and in the interest of all my constituents. Nor do I mean the gulf between those who do and those who do not know from personal experience the impact and reality of immigration. Knowledge of the facts and concern about them has been spreading rapidly in parts of the kingdom where a Commonwealth immigrant is never seen. I mean the gulf between the overwhelming majority of people throughout this country on the one side and on the other side a tiny minority with almost a monopoly hold upon the channels of communication who seem determined not to know the facts and not to face the realities and who will resort to any device or extremity to blind both themselves and others. In an earlier speech in February, I had mentioned a class in school in my constituency where there was only one white child. I mentioned it as a fact calculated to bring home to people the size and concentration of the immigrant population. Immediately, I was denounced as lying or, retali or, re or retailing hearsay. And though the truth of what I said was confirmed in open council a few days later by the chairman of the education committee, the national press refrained from reporting it. And Roy Jenkins, the chancellor of the Exchequer, in a speech at Swansea three months later, who had only to lift the telephone on his desk to ascertain the truth, preferred to brand me as a liar by stating that no such school had ever been discovered. However, Nemesis had not long to wait, and in September, the very newspapers which had attacked me had the ignomini ignominy of having to report the existence not only in Wolverhampton, but in Birmingham of such classes, as well as the 90% immigrant school in my own constituency. So quickly does the incredible turn into what everybody knew all the time. Reverse discrimination. 
in the context of a bill which the native inhabitants of this country were bound to see as directed against themselves, an important part of my argument at Birmingham was the fact of reverse discrimination, that it is not the immigrant but the Briton who feels himself the toad beneath the harrow, in the areas where the immigrant population is spreading and taking root. This indeed was the background against which the opposition were justifiably claiming that the race relations bill would do more harm than good. To illustrate it, I described the typical situation of the last and usually elderly white inhabitants of a street or area otherwise wholly occupied by immigrants, and I did so by citing an individual case from Wolverhampton in a correspondent's own words. The outcry which followed illuminated like a lightning flash the gulf between those who do not know or want to know and the rest of the nation. Here were circumstances which those who know the facts know are being repeated over and over again at this very moment in the towns and cities affected by immigration, often with, with aggravations more distressing than in the case I cited. It was ordinary, not extraordinary. Yet all at once the air was filled with denunciation. I was romancing, I had picked up a hoary and verified legend. I had no evidence. Nobody could find the old lady. No more than the class with, with, with the one white child. Where do these people live who imagine that I, that what I related was so remarkable and incredible that they had to conclude it was apocryphal. What do they suppose happens or has been happening or will be happening as the growing immigrant numbers extend their areas of occupation? They must live either a long way off or they must live with their eyes tight shut. I will not betray those who write to me in confidence or expose to publicity those who understandably fear it. But as I have been traduced and defamed, I will select one out of the numerous witnesses who wrote and offered me their own evidence for the truth and typicality of what I have described. It is, I repeat, not something rare, not something abnormal, but something which is part of the daily life and experience of fellow countrymen of ours who happen to be less fortunately situated than Mr. Rees Mogg, or Mr. Bernard Levin. Now, I believe this is talking about Mr. Rees-Mogg Sr., um, father of the uh, of, of Jacob Rees-Mogg, who, who was, I think, involved in maybe The Guardian at the time and, and, and published some very negative comments about Enoch Powell. Dr. W. E. Bamford, on the 17th of August, writes to me from 408 Garrett Lane, SW18, after describing his experiences in attending a patient aged 84 on the second floor of a house owned by an immigrant landlord, as a result of which the police have since provided me with a police escort each time I visited the patient. He continues, I saw her with the consultant geriatrician from St. John's Hospital on Tuesday the 13th of August. His advice was that it was best to cut one's losses, as she would eventually be intimidated out of her home. He arranged to admit her to St. John's with a view to rehabilitation and finding another home for her. It is very tragic that this poor old lady should now have to leave her home and possessions where she had spent most of her life, but there seems no other solution. I am most reluctant to cause any racial disharmony. I have many coloured patients on my list and I believe my relations with persons of all colours have always been harmonious. I would like to draw your attention to a few other incidents which involve my patients. One, an elderly widow of 80 plus had the house in which she was living bought by a West Indian family. The old lady was intimidated by having A, her bell disconnected, B, her letters not received, C, when she went out she would come back to find water had been poured on her bed, D, her possessions were broken, E, in the darkness, when going upstairs, she would receive a thump on the back. F. She was accused of behaving immorally when she had a young technician in to do repairs to her broken possessions. 
In spite of information, the police, she had no witnesses, and the fact that I informed the MOH, Dr. Garland, and the health visitor, she was intimidated out of her home eventually. Two, a widow with two young children was similarly intimidated by the knocking on the wall and the disturbance of her sleep, sleeping children at all hours of the night by West Indian neighbours. Actual damage was caused to her ceiling and walls. She had to leave in spite of appeals to the police. Three, a young English couple were intimidated out of their flat by their West Indian landlord by verbal abuse and filth smeared on or and around their toilet. There is just one witness, just a few examples, but let no one object that they are just a, just a few. Ask those who know and they will tell you whether all that is exceptional. Increase in numbers. Let no one object, either that they are bad British landlords too. Sorry, let me start that again. Let no one object either that there are bad British landlords too, that British people bully and maltreat British people and so on. I know, I have never said or implied that immigrants are more predisposed to vicious or spiteful behaviour than the indigenous population, though their customs and their social habits and expectations may be widely different. There is no reason to suppose that they are more malevolent or more prone to wrongdoing. That is, however, not the point. With the, mal with the malefactors among our own people, we have got to cope. They are our own responsibility and part of our, our own society. It is something totally different when the same or similar activities are perpetrated by strangers, and above all when they occur in the course of an increase in the numbers of those strangers and an extension of the areas which they occupy, an increase and an extension to which the victims perceive no end in sight. Surely only very clever people could fail to understand so simple a point. The issue is not, as some people appear to imagine, one of being nice to the immigrants or strangers in our midst, however diverse their race or culture. The issue is an issue of numbers now and especially in the future. And so I come to the question of numbers and of the increase in numbers, for it is the very heart of the matter. As Lord Eldon once put it, if it were known in my home village that the Archbishop of Canterbury were coming to live there, we should undoubtedly ring a peal on the church bells. If it were known that five archbishops were coming, I should still expect to see my neighbours exchanging excited congratulations in the street corners. But if it were known that 50 archbishops were coming, there would be a riot. First, let us get our sense of perspective. Let us look at present numbers. There are today in this country about one and a quarter million Commonwealth immigrants, though the basis of the statistics is far from perfect and the number is likely to be more rather than less. Suppose that any government 15 years ago had declared, it is our intention that by 1968 one and a quarter million Afro-Asians shall have entered this country and settled in it. People would not have believed their ears. Of course, no government, no party, would have dared to put forward such a proposal. If they had, they would have been hissed out of office. Yet the thing is no less absurd or monstrous now that it has become a reality than it would have seemed to everybody beforehand. It never was proposed or argued on grounds of supplying labour or skill. Indeed, it could not be, for that has nothing to do with the immigration. The doctors, aliens as well as Commonwealth citizens, who have made it possible, by getting a few years of postgraduate experience in Britain, to expand the hospital service faster than would otherwise have been possible, have no more to do with immigration than have the au pair girls admitted for a year or two to give domestic help, or the workers moving temporarily from one common market country to another. Those who still talk about needing immigrant doctors, dentists and teachers are not really talking about immigration at all. As for unskilled labour, the mere attempt to justify mass importation of it would have been exploded by economists and trade unions alike. 
the remedy for shortage of labour in a developed economy is more capital and better organisation. In short, it is only now that this has happened and the, and the people of Britain are faced with a fait accompli, that all sorts of excuses are invented and we are told in terms of arrogant moral superiority that we have got a multiracial society and had better like it. Look to the future. Yet if that were all, it could be endured. With their almost incredible tolerance, the English, it is virtually only England which is affected, would settle down to live with what they had neither asked for, nor wanted, nor were warned of, nor understood. But the present, this one and a quarter million reality, however inconceivable it would have been in prospect, this is not all. People look to the future, and as they do so, they remember that they have been betrayed and misled in the past. It is our duty not to betray or mislead them again. It is easy to understand how enormously strong is the temptation for all politicians to balk at, the, at this vision of the future, and not least for my own party, the Conservative Party, which formed the government for the country during the crucial years and would fain close its eyes and ears to the wholly unnecessary and avoidable havoc in its own inaction wrought. A tragedy which need never have been enacted. If Britain had provided herself in 1956 instead of 1962 with what every other nation under the sun possesses, a law defining its own people, what a world of anguish past and future would never have been. Even those of us who invade against the British Nationality Act of 1948 from the outset, and who, from inside and from outside government, urge legislation over the years, feel an oppressive sense of guilt and humiliation. The temptation to close our eyes to the future is correspondingly strong, but it is a temptation that has to be conquered. Even more dangerous is the too common taunt, you did the wrong, you have no right to talk about it now. Woe betide the nation that will not let its rulers admit their errors and try to remedy the consequences. There is no surer way to persist on a dangerous course until it is too late than to attach the penalty of mockery to those who say we have done wrong. Let us take as our starting point the calculation of the General Register Office that by 1985 there would be in this country three and a half million coloured immigrants and their offspring. In other words, that the present number would have increased between two and three fold in the next 17 years. On two assumptions, current rate of intake and current birth rate. I have been endlessly accused of using this figure without regard to those assumptions. I did not. In my previous speech, I expressly qualified it as being on present trends, and to the consideration of those two assumptions, I now address myself. The first assumption is that the rate of net inflow continues as at present. It has not indeed diminished since the estimate was made, but I am willing to, to suppose that, especially with the substantially greater limitations which a Conservative government has undertaken to apply, the rate would be markedly reduced during the period in question. For the purposes of argument, I will suppose that it falls to a steady rate from 60,000 from 60, in 1968 to nil in 1985. In that case, the total in the latter year would be reduced by about half a million, that is to three million. I now turn to the second and more crucial assumption, the birth rate. There are those who argue that the longer the immigrant population is resident in this country, the more closely their birth rate will approximate to that of the indigenous population, and thus, of course, to a rate of increase at which their population to the total would remain static, their proportion to the total would remain static. Now, I have no doubt that an immigrant element thoroughly absorbed into a host population does tend to have the same birth rate, and I also have no doubt that among our Commonwealth immigrants, the small minority to whom that description can be applied may soon show evidence of this. 
but to suppose that the habits of the great mass of immigrants living in their own communities, speaking their own languages and maintaining their native customs will change appreciably in the next two or three decades is a supposition so grotesque that only those who make it only those that only those could make it who are determined not to admit that they know to be true or not to see bleh, put my teeth in let's try that again but to suppose that the habits of the great mass of immigrants living in their own communities speaking their own languages and maintaining their native customs will change appreciably in the next two or three decades is a supposition so grotesque that only those could make it who are determined not to admit what they know to be true or not to see what they fear. On the contrary, there are grounds for arguing that the immigrant birth rate is more likely to rise during the next two or three decades. For instance, the population of females must increase as dependents join male workers, so that a given total of immigrant population so that a given total of immigrant population will yield more family units. Let me take you and show let me take you and show you the process actually happening. In the con in the country borough of Wolverhampton as recently enlarged to a total population of 267,000 in 1967, the proportion of immigrants and their offspring was 5.13% on the basis of the 1966 sample census. Though, of course, as the borough now includes large suburbs which are wholly white, this percentage gives no idea of the proportions or concentration in the inner zones of the borough. Now, that, now, now, that immigrant population, which forms 5.13% of the whole, produces no less than 23% of the births. That is, while one in 20 of the population is an immigrant, one in four of the births is an immigrant birth. I am not return referring to births in maternity beds. There the immigrant population is higher still, one in three, but to total births. And before anyone calls me a liar, I might mention that the figures are those of the Borough Medical Officer of Health, and may be found reprinted amongst other places in the Lancet for the 26th of October. The procession and the rate at which it gathers numbers year by year can be traced as it moves upwards through the schools. Here are the percentages of immigrant children in the Wolverhampton schools last April reading upwards. Infant school, 17.1%. Junior and infant schools, 12.7%. Junior schools, 10.9%. Secondary schools, 9.7%. However, even those figures do not fully reflect the rate at which births have been rising hitherto, because they include not only children born to immigrants in this country, but children who have immigrated when of or under school age. And the Asian and West Indian children of school age are still arriving in Wolverhampton at the rate of eight to 900 a year. The idea that the size of the immigrant population, even without any net intake at all, is destined from now onwards to increase little more rapidly than that of the indigenous population can not seriously be sustained in the face of the sort of reality I have described. The only prudent assumption is that the present trend will continue for at least a decade or two. This is the assumption which underlies the Registrar General's projection and gives the figure of 3 million for 1985, after allowing, as I have done, for reduction of intake. I am reassured that I am not far from the mark when I notice that a year ago, the Home Office spokesman, who can hardly be accused of wanting to play the numbers up, arrived, two and a half, at, arrived at 2.5 million in 1985, as the lowest figure he could foresee, after making the utmost allowances both on intake and on birth rate. After 1985, we may perhaps allow ourselves to hope for a decline in the rate of reproduction, but if the following 17 years, instead of multiplication by their factor of, by the factor or two, as between 67 and 85, resulted only in multiplication by a factor of one and a half, the total immigrant and immigrant descended population at the end of the century, to be precise, in 2002, would be four and a half million. 
or three and a half times the present number. And that is assuming no further net immigration at all after 1985, bearing in mind that the assumptions which produce this figure are deliberately pitched low, it will be seen that my reference at Birmingham to something in the region of 5 to 7 million for the year 2000 on present trends was neither random nor ill-considered. Several Washingtons. Now, if that minimum figure of 4.5 million is expressed as a percentage of the projected population of the United Kingdom for the year 2000, it works out at a little over 6%. But of course, it is monstrously fallacious thus to divide the immigrant population into that of the UK as a whole. I do not know what would be the aspect of a United Kingdom where uniformly 1 in 18 of the population in Easington and Exeter in Aberystwyth and Aberdeen, in Antrim and Eastbourne, was an Afro-Asian, but that is not how it would be. The very growth in numbers would increase the already striking fact of, gen of dense geographical concentration so that the urban part of whole towns and cities in Yorkshire, the Midlands, and the home counties would be preponder preponderantly or exclusively Afro-Asian in population there would be several Washingtons in England. From these whole areas, the indigenous population, the people of England, who fondly imagine that this is their country and these are their hometowns, would have been dislodged. I have deliberately chosen the most neutral word I could find. And here, for the first time this morning, I offer a subjective judgment. Because... In the nature of the case, there can be no other, and because on such a matter, it is the duty of a politician to make and to declare his judgment. I do so hope, not unduly moved, though why should I not be moved, by the hundreds, no thousands, of my countrymen who speak to me or write to me of their fear and foreboding, the old who rejoice that they will not live to see what is to come the young who are determined that their children shall not grow up under the shadow of it. My judgment then is this. The people of England will not endure it. If so, it is idle to argue whether they ought to or ought not to. I do not believe it is in human nature that a country and a country such as ours should passively watch the transformation of whole areas which lie at the heart of it into alien territory. On these two grounds, then, the prospective growth of numbers with its physical consequences and the unacceptability of those consequences rests the urgency of action. We can perhaps not reduce the eventual total of the immigrant and immigrant descended population much, if at all, below its present size. With that, and with all that implies, we and our children and our children's children will have to cope until the slow mercy of the years absorbs even that unparalleled invasion of our body politic. What I believe we can do, and therefore must do, is to avert the impending disaster of its increase. And of course, today, we stand at some 20 million immigrant and immigrant descended. Repatriation. There are two, and so far as I can see, only two measures available to this end. Both are obvious. One is far more important and far more difficult than the other. If further net immigration were virtually to cease at once, that would reduce the prospective total for 1985 by a further half million, and would have a somewhat more than proportionate effect on whatever is to be the rate of increase after 1985. As I have pointed out, the inflow, consisting as it does mostly of dependents, forms the basis of new family units for the future. I say virtually cease because, of course, no one would wish an absolute veto on the settlement of individual Afro-Asians in this country in future, any more than any other aliens. But let there be no prevarication about what is meant. What is meant is that we could cease to admit not only new settlers and their dependents, but the dependents or remaining dependents of immigrants already here. The first half of this presents no human difficulty. 
If we admit no new settlers, there is no problem about their dependents. The problem attaches to the reservoir of dependents who have not yet joined immigrants already here. In this case, we have to decide between two evils, the denial of entry to an immigrant's dependents and the consequences of the prospective growth in numbers. But here the minor issues the minor issue merges into the major one, that of repatriation. I have argued that on any prudent view, uh, quite apart from any subsequent immigration, the future prospect is unacceptable. Hence the key significance of repatriation, or at any rate, re-emigration. A policy of assisting repatriation by payment of fares and grants is part of the official policy of the Conservative Party. It is a just, rational and humane policy. It accepts that a wrong has unintentionally been done to the immigrant by placing him in a position where the future is as pregnant with trouble for him as for the rest of the population. And it accepts the duty of reinstating him as far as possible. As my colleague Mr Boyd Carpenter pointed out in a speech at Blackpool recently which has received too little attention, it would provide the fair answer for the immigrant here whose dependents were not permitted to join him. The question is, what would be the practical scope and application of such a policy? I believe that ignorance of the realities of Commonwealth immigration leads people seriously to underestimate the scope of the policy and thus to neglect and despise the chief key to the situation. Perhaps it is the historical associations of the word immigrant which create in those remote which create in those remote from the facts the picture of individuals who have left their homes behind forever to seek new future to seek a new future in a far off land rather in the mood of those Victorian pictures of the emigrants farewell. Communities intact. Of course there are many of course, there are many cases where individuals have uprooted themselves to come here, but in the mass it is much nearer to the truth to think in terms of detachments from communities in the West Indies or India or Pakistan encamped in certain areas of England. They are still to a large extent apart economically and socially of the communities from which they have been detached and to which they regard themselves as belonging. A recently published study of one of the West Indian islands put it thus. Migrant communities in Britain are linked to their home, uh, home societies by an intricate network of ties and obligations. There are strong social pressures for members of, of, a community to, of a community to send back money to their families in the island, where most of them expect to return eventually. The ideology of migration and the social networks formed around it are so, so closely connected that it is rare for migrants to abandon one without leaving the other. Thus, migrants who decide to stay permanently in Britain often cut themselves off from the others. This description could apply even more strongly to the communities from India and Pakistan, whose total numbers now exceed the West Indian, and whose links with their homes are kept in being by a constant flow not only of remittances accounting to many millions um, per year, but of personal visits and exchanges, the scale of which would astonish anyone not closely acquainted with the actual phenomenon of Commonwealth immigration in this country. The annual holiday back home in the West Indies or in India or in Pakistan is no rare feature of life in the immigrant communities. Against this background, a programme of large-scale voluntary, but organised, financed and subsidised repatriation and re-immigration becomes indeed an administrative and political task of great magnitude. But something neither absurdly impracticable, nor less inhuman, but on the contrary as profoundly humane as it is far-sighted. Under an agreement between Ceylon and India for the repatriation of more than half a million Indians over 15 years, 35,000 return to India each year with their assets. The government of Guyana is anxious to promote the re-emigration to that country of West Indians and others who can help to build up its economy and develop its resources. 
A cursory survey carried out by a national newspaper six months ago indicated that over 20% of immigrants, re, of, of immigrants interviewed would contemplate availing themselves of an opportunity to go home. It need not even follow that the income from work done here in Britain would be suddenly lost to the, to the home communities if permanent settlement of population were replaced by what many countries in Europe and elsewhere are familiar with the temporary, albeit often long-term, intake of labour. The resettlement of a substantial proportion of the Commonwealth immigrants in Britain is not beyond the resources and abilities of this country, if it is undertaken as a national duty in the successful discharge of which the interests both of the immigrants themselves and of the countries from which they came are engaged. It ought to be and it could be organised now on the scale which the urgency of the situation demands, preferably under a special ministry for repatriation or other authority charged with concentrating on the task. Without a country. At present, large numbers of the offspring of immigrants, even those born here in Britain, remain integrated in the immigrant community which links them with their homeland overseas. With every passing year, this will diminish. Some people point to the increasing proportion of immigrant offspring born in this country as if the fact contained within itself the ultimate solution. The truth is the opposite. The West Indian or Asian does not, by being born in England, become an Englishman. In law, he becomes a United Kingdom citizen by birth, and in fact, he is a West Indian or an Asian still. Unless he be one of the small minority, for number, I repeat again and again, is of the essence, he will, by the very nature of things, have lost one country without gaining another, lost one nationality without acquiring a new one. Time is running against us and them. With the lapse of a generation or so, we shall at last have succeeded, to the benefit of nobody, in reproducing, reproducing in England's green and pleasant land the haunting tragedy of the United States. The English as a nation have their own peculiar faults. One of them is that strange passivity in the face of danger or absurdity or provocation, which has more than once in our history lured observers into false conclusions conclusion sometimes fatal to the observers themselves about the underlying intentions and the true determination of our people. What so far no one could accuse us of is a propensity to abandon hope. In the face of severe and even seemingly insurmountable obstacles, dejection is not one of our national traits, but we must be told the truth and shown the danger if we are to meet it. Rightly or wrongly, I, for my part, believe that the time for that has come. And that is the end of the chapter on immigration. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed listening along today. And we will very shortly be concluding this book with the final chapter, um, Myth and Reality, which I hope... I hope um, to cover with some guests as that would be quite a fitting end to the book. But um, thank you for all those who have listened along so far and provided comments and discussion. And uh, I hope to see you all again next time. Have a good day.